afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. For our in-house guests, we, of course, appreciate your checking that mobile devices have been silenced or turned off as a courtesy. For those watching online, you're welcome to send questions or comments at any time simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. And, of course, we will post the program on the Heritage homepage following our presentation. Leading our discussion and welcoming our special guest is David Azarad, who serves as the AWC Family Foundation Fellow. He is also director of the B. Kenneth Simon Center for Principles and Politics. David? Welcome to the Heritage Foundation. In the beginning, there was Brexit. <laughs> On June 25th, 2016, the British people ignored the apocalyptic warnings of the intelligentsia and the veiled threats of President Barack Obama and decided to leave the European Union. Four months later, the Trumpian earthquake hit the US and reverberated across the world when Donald Trump pulled off what is arguably the greatest political upset in American history. Suddenly, there was talk of a rising transatlantic populist tide that, depending on your view, would either mark the rebirth or the final decline of democracy. The age of populism had arrived, or so we were told. But then in March, Geert Wilders lost the Dutch parliamentary elections. And then last month, the establishment candidate Emmanuel Macron soundly defeated the fiery populist candidate Marine Le Pen in the French presidential elections. Meanwhile, at home, the Trump presidency has been off to a rather rocky start. The very same experts who a, very, who a few months ago were telling us that the age of populism had arrived are now telling us that we may have reached peak populism. And after all of this huffing and puffing, the term itself, the idea itself, populism, still remains a somewhat nebulous idea in the minds of most people. What exactly is populism? The term doesn't appear in our greatest political treaties, the Federalist. To the extent that Publius speaks of the people, he acknowledges them as the fountain of all legitimate authority, but also emphasizes the dangers of direct democracy. The government should not mindlessly channel the will of the people, but rather refine and enlarge it. Many today therefore claim the mantle of the founders and see populism as a form of demagoguery that threatens to overwhelm our Republican institutions. Others, however, see it as the last best hope for democracy, a justified revolt of people against a ruling class that is at best overbearing and incompetent, and at worst, corrupt and unpatriotic. In this vein, Francis Fukuyama has defined populism as the label that political elites attach to policies supported by people that they don't like. To help us better understand what populism means, especially here in America, and to help us think through its implications for democracy, we are very pleased to have with us Roger Kimball. Roger Kimball is the editor and publisher of The New Criterion, the premier conservative cultural review, a monthly journal that upholds what is left of Western civilization and exposes charlatanism in all its forms. Since last September, the new Criterion has been running an excellent series of essays on populism that has featured contributions by Victor Davis Hanson, Roger Scruton, Daniel Hannon, and in the latest issue, Roger Kimball. Uh, Roger is also the president and publisher of Encounter Books, arguably the finest conservative book publisher today. He himself is the author of several books, including The Fortunes of Permanence, Tenured Radicals, and a favorite of mine, The Long March, How the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s Changed America, one of the best books on the radicalism of the 60s. He's a frequent contributor to many publications, including the Times Literary Supplement, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times Book Review, and the Sunday Telegraph. Many of you, I am sure, follow his blog, Roger's Rules, at PJ Media. Please join me in welcoming Roger Kimball. Thank you, David. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, of course, it's an honor to speak at the Heritage Foundation, one of the most 
robust and effective bulwarks of political maturity in the country. And, and it's more than an honor uh, for me to speak under the aegis of the great Russell Kirk, a man with whom I feel deep affinity, although I never had the privilege of meeting him. For me, as I'd wager for many people in this room, Kirk's 1953 masterpiece, The Conservative Mind, is nothing less than a revelation. Acton, Burke, Babbitt, Disraeli, Santayana, Fitzjames, Stevens, and on and on. It was a whole alternative universe that Kirk opened up. It's sometimes said that William F. Buckley Jr. rescued American conservatism from irrelevance. Russell Kirk, I think, rescued it from ignorance and superficiality. At one point in the conservative mind, Kirk defines conservatism as the negation of ideology, which is to say, conservatism rejects the habit of mistaking abstractions for human realities. In the context of our present political dispensation, Kirk noted, that means that one of conservatism's primary tasks will be, quote, resistance to the idea of total society in which the state smothers individuality and enforces a stultifying bureaucratic conformity. In my brief remarks today, I'd like to expand on that grand Kirkian theme by considering the careers of three words. Let me start with two, populism and democracy. Among other things, these two words remind us of the curious fact that certain words accumulate a nimbus of positive associations, while others, semantically just as innocuous, wind up shouldering a portfolio of bad feelings. Think about it. Do you know any responsible person who would admit to being opposed to democracy? No one who does not enjoy a large private income would risk it. But lots of people are willing to declare themselves anti-populist. The discrepancy is curious, I think, for several reasons. For one thing, it is a testament to the almost Darwinian hardiness of the word democracy. In the fierce struggle among ideas for survival, democracy has not only survived, but thrived. And this is despite the fact that political thinkers from Plato and Aristotle through Cicero and down to modern times have been deeply suspicious of democracy. Aristotle thought democracy was the worst form of government, all but inevitably leading to ochlocracy, to mob rule, which is no rule. In Federalist 10, as uh, David was alluding to, uh, James Madison famously warned that history had shown that democratic regimes have, quote, in general, been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. Theoretic politicians, he wrote, and it would be hard to find a more contemptuous deployment of the word theoretic. Such politicians, said Madison, may have advocated democracy, but that is only because of their dangerous and utopian ignorance of human nature. It was not at all clear, Madison thought, that democracy was a reliable custodian of liberty. Nevertheless, nearly everyone wants to associate himself with the word democracy. Totalitarian regimes like to describe themselves as the democratic republic of wherever it is. Uh, conservatives champion the advantages of democratic capitalism. Central planners of all stripes eagerly deploy programs advertising as enhancing or extending democracy. And even James Madison came down on the side of a subspecies of democracy, one filtered through the modulating influence of a large, diverse population uh, and an elaborate scheme of representation that attenuated the influence of what Madison delicately called the people and their collective capacity. Democracy, in short, is a eulogistic word. What the practical philosopher Stephen Potter in another context, apostrophized as an okay word 
And it is worth noting, as Potter would have been quick to remind us, that the people pronouncing those eulogies delight in advertising themselves as, and are generally accepted as, okay people. Indeed, the class element and the element of moral appro approbation of what some genius has summarized as virtue signaling is key. It is quite otherwise with the word populism. Now, at first blush, this seems odd because populism occupies a semantic space closely adjacent to the word democracy. Democracy, after all, means rule by the, the demos, the, the people. Populism, according to the American Heritage Dictionary, describes, quote, a political philosophy directed to the needs of the common people and advancing a more equitable distribution of wealth and power. That is, just the sorts of things that the people, were they to rule, would seek. But the fact is that populism is ambivalent at best. Sometimes, it is true, a charismatic figure can survive uh, and even illuminate the label populism like a personal halo. Bernie Sanders managed this trick among the uh, echo-conscious, racially omnivorous, non-gender stereotyping, anti-capitalist beneficiaries of capitalism <laughs> that made up his core constituency. But it was always my impression that in this case, in the case of Sanders, that the term populist was fueled less by him or his followers than by his rivals in the, and the media in an effort to fix him in the public mind as one of the many laminatable examples of not Hillary, who herself was presumed to be popular, though not, heaven forfend, populist. Now, there are at least two sides to the negative association under which the term populist struggles. On the one hand, on the one hand, there is the issue of demagoguery. Some commentators tell us that populist and demagogue are essentially synonyms, though they rarely point out that the word demagogos in Greek simply means a popular leader, for example, Pericles. The association of demagoguery and populism describes what we might call the command and control aspect of populism. The populist leader is said to forsake reason and moderation in order to stir the dark, thonic passions uh, of a semi-literate and spiritually unelevated populace. In the current issue of the New York Review of Books, for example, the historian Christopher Browning has a review of a book about Hitler's rise to power. At least, that's the ostensible subject of the review. The real subject, the real subject of this disgusting and disingenuous essay is to lambaste a character that Browning calls Trump the populist. There are, Browning allows, quote, many significant differences between Hitler and Trump. <laughs> Think about that. As Francisco says at the beginning of Hamlet, well, for this relief, much thanks. <laughs> but of course, it is the alleged, not to say fantastical similarities between Trump and Hitler that Browning conjures that the reader is meant to carry away with him. The lesson of Hitler's rise is that he should have been squashed at the beginning. Do it early, Browning advises, as if Donald Trump bore any relevant similarity to the Nazi Fuhrer. On the other hand, there is the issue of the fertile but unedifying soil that, pop, uh, that the populace upon which the demagogic leader works. Anyone who has looked at the commentary on Brexit, the campaign in early months of the Trump administration, of the recent French election will have noted this. Consider, to take just one example, how often the word anger and its cognates are deployed to evoke the psychological and moral failings of both the populist multitude and its putative leaders. In a remarkable apocalyptic effusion published in the early hours of November 9th, 2016, David Remnick the editor of The New Yorker warned that the Trump presidency represented a, quote, rebellion against liberalism itself, an angry assault on the civil rights of women, blacks, immigrants, homosexuals, and countless others. 
Later commentators warned about our angry and cynical times, the, quote, raw, angry, and aggrieved tone of Trump's rhetoric, the unchaperoned anger of Americans who felt that they had been left behind. CNN dilated on how, quote, Trump's anger could lead down a dangerous road while the Washington Post, where democracy goes to die, promised to take its readers inside Trump's anger and impatience. And the New York Times endeavored to explain how festering anger at Comey ended in his firing. Now, there were occasional acknowledgments that the diagnosed anger may be understandable, even justified. Uh, if only we had more government programs to assuage these people, it would be go away. But we are left with the unmistakable impression that the phenomenon as a whole is something vicious and irrational. Anger festers. It leads to sudden, that is, impulsive decisions, and the road it steered us toward could be dangerous. Populism, in short, seems incapable of escaping the association with demagoguery and moral darkness. Like the foul-smelling wounds of Philoctetes, the stench is apparently incurable. Granted, there are plenty of historical reasons for the association between demagoguery and populism, as such names as the brothers Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus, Father Coughlin, Huey Long, not to mention Mr. Browning's friend Eloff, to remind us. Still, still, I suspect that the, in the present context, the apparently unbreakable association between populism and demagoguery has less to do with any natural affinity than with cunning rhetorical weaponization. Where democracy is a eulogistic word, populism is wielded less as a descriptive than as a delegitimizing term. Successfully charge someone with populist sympathies, and you get free and for nothing, both the imputation of demagoguery and what was famously derided as a deplorable and irredeemable cohort. The element of existential depreciation is almost palpable. So is the element of condensation. Inseparable from the diagnosis of populism is the implication not just of incompetence, but also of a crudity that is part aesthetic and part moral. Hence the curiously visceral distaste expressed by elite opinion for signs of populist sympathy. When Hillary Clinton charged that half of Donald Trump's supporters were an irredeemable basket of deplorables, when Barack Obama castigated small town Republican voters as bitter folk who cling to guns or religion or antipathy to people who aren't like them, what they expressed was not disagreement, but condescending revulsion. I think I first became aware that the charge of populist sympathies could have a powerful political, moral, and class delegitimizing effect when I was in London last year about this time to cover the Brexit vote. Nearly everyone I met, from Tory ministers to taxi drivers, from tourists to tradesmen, was a remainer. The higher up the income and class scale you went, the more likely it was that your interlocutor would be in favor of Britain's remaining in the European Union, and the more pointed would be his disparagement of those arguing in favor of Brexit. The Brexiteers were said to be angry, of course, but also <coughs> ignorant, fearful, xenophobic, and racist. Except that they weren't, at least not the ones that I met. And this brings me to the third word I'd like to ponder this afternoon, sovereignty. For the pro-Brexit people I met, the issue, the issue of Britain's relation to the European Union turned on a simple question. Who rules? Who rules? Is the ultimate source of British sovereignty parliament, as it had been, has had been the case for centuries? Or is it Brussels, seat of the European Union? The question of sovereignty, I believe, takes us to the heart of what in recent years has been touted and also tarred as the populist project. Consider Britain. Parliament answers to the British voters. The European answers to, well, to itself. 
Indeed, it is worth pausing to remind ourselves how profoundly anti-democratic is the European Union. Its commissioners are appointed, not elected. They meet in secret. They cannot be turned out of office by voters. If the public votes contrary to the wishes of the EU's commissars in a referendum, they are simply presented with another referendum and another until they vote the right way. Think about this. The Europeans' financial books have never been subject to a public audit because the corruption is just too widespread. Yet the EU's agents wield extraordinary power over the everyday lives of their charges. A commissioner in Brussels can tell a property owner in Wales what kind of potatoes he may and may not plant, uh, how he must calculate the weight of the products he sells, and whom he must allow into his country. He can, quote, lawfully suppress, as the London Telegraph reported, political criticism of its institutions and of leading figures, thus rendering the com commissars of the EU not only beyond the vote, but also beyond criticism. It's a little different in the United States, and I'll come to that presently. At the moment, it is worth pausing to note to what extent the metabolism of this political dispensation was anticipated by Alexis de Tocqueville in his famous passages about democratic despotism and democracy in America, familiar, I'm sure, to everyone in this room. Unlike despotisms of yore, Tocqueville wrote, this modern allotrope does not tyrannize over men. It infantilizes him. And it does this by promulgating an ever more cumbersome, uh, ever more cumbersome set of rules and regulations that reach into the interstices of everyday life to hamper initiative, stymie independence, stifle originality, and homogenize, uh, homogenize individuality. This power, said Tocqueville, quote, extends its arms over society as a whole and finally reduces each na nation to being nothing more than a herd of timid and industrious animals of which government is the shepherd. Tocqueville's analysis has led many observers to conclude that the villain in this drama is the state. But the political philosopher James Burnham, writing in the early 1940s in The Managerial Revolution, saw that the real villain was not the state as such, but rather the bureaucracy that maintained and managed it. The shepherd of which Tocqueville wrote was really a flock of shepherds, a coterie of managers who, in the guise of doing the state's business, prosecuted their own advantage and gradually became a self-perpetuating elite that arrogated to itself power over the levers of society. This separation of the real power of society from the economy and political life renders the managerial elite all but untouchable. And this, as Burnham saw, was the property neither of liberalism nor of conservatism, but rather of anterior forces that engulfed both. Sovereignty was shifting from parliaments to what Burnham called administrative bureaus, which increasingly are the seats of real power and as such proclaim the rules, make the laws, issue the decrees. As far back as the early 1940s, Burnham could write that, quote, laws today in the United States are not made any longer by Congress, but by the NLRB the SEC, the ICC, the AAA, whatever that is, the TVA, the FTC, the FCC, the Office of Production Management, that's a nice phrase, and the other leading executive agencies. And note that Burnham was writing decades before the advent of the EPA, HUD, the CFPB, uh, FSOC, the Department of Education, and the rest of the administrative alphabet soup that governs us in the United States today. As the economist Charles Colomiris points out in his important just published book, Reforming Financial Regulation, we are increasingly governed not by laws, but by ad hoc diktats emanating from semi-autonomous and largely unaccountable quasi-governmental bureaucratic uh, uh, agencies, many of which meet in secret, but whose proclamations have the force of law. <clears throat> I'm convinced that the issue of sovereignty of what we might call the location of sovereignty, 
has played a large role in the rise of the phenomenon we describe as populism in the United States, as well as in Europe. For one thing, the question of sovereignty of who governs us stands behind the rebellion against the political correctness and moral meddlesomeness that are such conspicuous and disfiguring features of our increasingly bureaucratic society. The smothering Tocquevillian blanket of regulatory excess has had a wide range of practical and economic effects, stifling entrepreneurship and making any sort of uh, productive innovation difficult. But perhaps its deepest effects are spiritual or psychological. The many assaults against free speech on college campuses, the demand for safe spaces and trigger warnings against verbal or fashion-inspired microaggressions, you know, Mexican hats, offensive Halloween costumes and the like, are part of this dictatorship of political correctness. In The Road to Serfdom, Friedrich Hayek said that one of the main points of his argument concerned the, quote, psychological change, the alteration of the character of a people that extensive government control brought in its wake. The alteration involves a process of softening, innervation, infantilization even, an exchange of the challenges of liberty and self-reliances, the challenges, that is to say, of adulthood for the coddling pleasures of dependence. Breaking with that drift becomes more and more difficult the more habituated to dependence a people becomes. In this sense, what has been described as a populist upsurge against political correctness is simply a reassertion of independence, a reclamation of what turns out to be a most uncommon virtue, common sense. The question of sovereignty also stands behind the debate over immigration. Indeed, is any issue more central to the question of who governs than who gets to decide a nation's borders and how a country defines its first person plural, the we that makes us who we are as a people? Throughout his campaign, Donald Trump promised to enforce immigration laws, to end so-called sanctuary cities, which advertise themselves as safe havens for illegal aliens, though of course we are not supposed to call them illegal aliens, and to sharpen vetting procedures for people wishing to immigrate to America from countries known as sponsors of terrorism. The president sometimes overstated and not infrequently misstated his case. Semantic precision, I think, is not a Trumpian specialty. But political effectiveness just may be. Behind the Sturm and und Drang that greeted Trump's rhetoric on immigration, we can glimpse two very different concepts of the nation state and the world order. One view sees the world as a collection of independent sovereign countries that although interacting with one another, regard the care, safety, and prosperity of their own citizens as their first obligation. This is the traditional view of the nation state. It is also Donald Trump's view. It is what licenses his talk of putting America first, a concept that Pacha the anti-Trump media has nothing to do with Charles Lindbergh's isolationist movement of the late 1930s and everything to do with fostering a healthy sense of national identity and purpose. The alternative view regards the nation state with suspicion as an atavistic form of political and social organization. The nation state might still be a practical necessity, but the argument goes, it is a regrettable necessity inasmuch as it retards mankind's emancipation from the parochial bonds of place and local allegiance. Ideally, according to this view, we are citizens of the world, not particular countries, and our fundamental obligation is to all mankind, not to our fellow citizens. This is the progressive view, and it has many progenitors and antecedents, but none, I think, is more influential than Immanuel Kant's 1795 essay, Perpetual Peace. Kant lists various conditions for the initial establishment of peace, the eventual abolition of standing armies, for example, and a few conditions for its perpetuation. The extension of, quote, universal hospitality by nations was something that caught my eye. Ditto, world citizenship. Kant makes many observations along the way 
that will be balm to progressive hearts. He is against, quote, the accumulation of treasure, for example, because wealth is a hindrance to perpetual peace. By the same token, he believes that forbidding the system of international credit that the British Empire employed must be a preliminary article of perpetual peace. Credit, after all, can be deployed to increase wealth, ergo it is suspect. Kant looked forward to the establishment of a Volkerbund, a League of Nations, all of which would freely embrace a republican form of government. It would be hard to overstate the influence of Kant's essay. It stands behind such progressive exfoliations as Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson's 14 points, not, <coughs> not the least the final point that looked forward to the establishment, of course, of a League of Nations. You can feel its pulse beating in the singing phrases of the 1928 kellogg briand Pact, which outlawed war. It is worth noting that the, among the initial 15 signatories of that noble-sounding pact, along with the United States and France and England, were Germany, Italy, <coughs> and Japan. What does that tell us about the folly of trusting paper proclamations not backed up by the authority of physical force? It is one thing to declare war illegal. It is quite another to enforce that edict. Kant's essay also directly inspired the architects of the United Nation, Nations and in our own day, the architects of the European Union and the battalions of transnational progressives who jettison democracy for the sake of a more or less nebulous, but not therefore uncoercive ideal of world citizenship. I would not care to wager how many of the hysterics who congregated at airports across the country to protest Donald Trump's effort to make the citizens of this country safer were students of Kant. Doubtless, very few. But all were his unwitting heirs. Universal hospitality. How the protesters would have liked that phrase. I have no doubt that the motivation of the protesters has many sources. But to the extent that it was based upon a political ideal and not just partisan posturing or a grubby bid for notoriety and power, the spirit of Kant was hovering there in the background. In this sense, the issue of sovereignty also stands behind the debates over the relative advantages of, uh, and moral weather, as it were, of globalism versus nationalism, a pair of terms almost as fraught as democracy and populism, as well as the correlative economic issues of underemployment and wage stagnation. Those whom Madison might have called theoretic politicians may advocate globalism as a necessary condition for free trade, but the spirit of local control tempers the cosmopolitan project of a borderless world with a recognition that the nation state has been the best guarantor not only of sovereignty, but also of broadly shared prosperity. What we might call the ideology of free trade the globalist aspiration to transcend the impediments of national identity and control is an abstraction that principally benefits its architects. As Rusty Reno, the editor of First Things, pointed out in a recent op-ed for the New York Times, quote, globalism poses a threat to the future of democracy because it disenfranchises the vast majority and empowers a technocratic elite. In the end, what James Burnham described as the managerial revolution is part of a larger progressive project. The aim of this project is partly to emancipate mankind from such traditional sources of self-definition as national identity, religious affiliation, and specific cultural rootedness, partly to perpetuate and aggrandize the apparatus that oversees the resulting dissolution. Burnham castigates this hypertrophied form of liberalism as a, quote, ideology of suicide. Now, he acknowledges that this may sound hyperbolic. The word suicide, he notes, may seem too emotive a term, too negative and bad. But it is part of the pathology that Burnham describes that such objections are, quote, most often made most hotly by Westerners who hate their own civilization readily excuse or even praise blows struck against it, and themselves lend a willing hand, frequently enough, 
to pulling it down. The issue, Burnham saw, is that modern liberalism has equipped us with an ethic too abstract and too empty to inspire real commitment. In Burnham's view, the primary function of liberalism was to, quote, permit Western civilization to be reconciled to its own dissolution, to view weakness, failure, and even collapse not as a defeat, but as a transition to a new and higher order in which mankind as a whole joins in a universal civilization that has risen above the parochial distinctions, divisions, and discriminations of the past. What has been called populism is a visceral reaction against these forces of dissolution. Around the time that Donald Trump took office, his chief strategist, Steve Bannon, said that his goal was to deconstruct the administrative state. The phrase administrative state, also called the regulatory state or the deep state, has lately floated into common parlance. In his recently published pamphlet, The Administrative Threat, the legal scholar Philip Hamburger describes it as a state within a state, a sort of parallel legal and political structure populated by unelected bureaucrats. This amorphous conjuries of agencies and regulations has become, Hamburger argues, the dominant reality of American governance, intruding everywhere into economic and social life. Article one of the Constitution vests all legislative power in Congress, just as Article Three vests all judicial power in the court. The administrative state is a mechanism for circumventing both. As such, Hamburger argues, the administrative state operate, operates outside the Constitution. Binding citizens, not through congressionally enacted statutes, but through the edicts of the managerial bureaucracy the administrative state, Hamburger says, is all about the evasion of governance through the law, including an evasion of constitutional processes and procedural rights. Accordingly, he concludes, the encroaching activity of the administrative state represents the nation's preeminent threat to civil liberties. Hamburger draws an analogy between the behavior of the administrative state today and the behavior of the despotic English monarchs of the 17th century. Instead of persuading parliament to repeal or revise a statute, British kings like Charles I or the two Jameses simply evaded its force by decreeing that some of their subjects or all of their subjects were not subject to its strictures. The king's power was absolute, not merely in the sense that it was all but unlimited, but also in the sense that it was independent or outside of the law. As a footnote, you students of Latin will recall that the ablative absolute, a construction in which an ablative phrase is absolutum, loosened from or separate from the independent uh, clause, the main clause of the sentence, works in a similar sort of way. Hamburger shows how the growth of the administrative state represents an extra legal revival of absolute power in this sense, one that threatens to transform constitutional rights and guarantees into mere options that the government bestows or withholds at its pleasure. The evasion, he notes, thereby changes the very nature of procedural rights. Such rights traditionally were assurances against the government. Now they are but one choice for the government to make in its exercise of power. Though the government must respect these rights when it proceeds against Americans in court, it has the freedom to escape them by taking an administrative path. Just as British kings in the 17th century evaded parliament through such expedients as the star chamber and the exercise of royal prerogative and waivers, what John Adams castigated as, quote, those badges of domination called prerogatives, so the administrative state today operates in violation of the Constitution and beyond the authority of Congress. Barack Obama decreed that certain politically unpalatable provisions of the Affordable Care Act not be enforced. And presto, they were not enforced, even though they, they were the law of the land. He instructed his Department of Justice to intervene to prevent Arizona and other states from enforcing certain aspects of immigration law. 
He even forced public institutions to accommodate self-declared transgender persons in the toilets of their choice. He connived with lawsuits punishing bakers and Catholic hospitals and hobby shops who chose not to join this week's politically correct campaign for the sexually exotic. The Constitution may have vested all legislative power in Congress and entrusted all judicial power to the courts, but the administrative state sidesteps those requirements by erecting a parallel bureaucratic structure of enforcement and control. 18th century Americans, Hamburger notes, assumed that a rule could have the obligation of law only if it came from the constitutionally established legislative, uh, legislature elected by the people. But today, Americans find their lives directed by a jumble of agencies far removed from the legislature and staffed by bureaucrats who make and enforce a vast network of rules that govern nearly every aspect of our lives. One of the most disturbing aspects of uh, Hamburger's analysis is the historical connection he exposes between the expansion of the franchise in the early 20th century and the growth of the administrative uh, state. For the people in charge, equality of voting rights was one thing. They could deal with that. But the tendency of newly enfranchised groups, the bitter clingers and deplorables of yore, to reject progressive initiatives was something else again. As Woodrow Wilson noted, sadly, quote, the bulk of mankind is rigidly unphilosophical, and nowadays the bulk of mankind votes. What to do? The solution was to shift real power out of elected bodies and into the hands of the right sort of people, enlightened people, progressive people, people, that is to say, like Woodrow Wilson. Thus, Wilson welcomed the advent of administrative power as a counterweight to encroaching democratization. And thus it was, as Hamburger points out, that we have seen a transfer of legislative power to the, quote, knowledge class, the managerial elite that James Burnham anatomized. A closer look at the knowledge class shows that what they principally know best how to do is to preserve and extend their own privilege. Its activities are swaddled in do-gooder rhetoric about serving the public looking after the environment, helping the disadvantaged, so and so on. But what they chiefly excel at is consolidating their own power. Now, no lecture undertaken under the aegis of Russell Kirk would be quite complete without a nod to Kirk's great inspiration, Edmund Burke. So I'm going to do that now. I'd like to conclude with a sentence from Burke's 1770 essay, Thoughts on the Causes of the Present Discontents of Perennial perennially pertinent title. In that essay, Burke criticized the court of George III for circumventing parliament and establishing by stealth what amounted to a new regime of royal prerogative and influence peddling. It was not as patent as the swaggering courts of James I or Charles I. George and his courtiers maintained the appearance of parliamentary supremacy, but a closer look that their activities showed that the system was corrupt. It was soon discovered, Burke wrote with sly understatement, that the forms of a free and the ends of an arbitrary government were not wholly incompatible, indeed. That discovery stands behind the growth of the administrative state. We still vote. We still have a bicameral legislature. But behind these forms of a free government, the essentially undemocratic activities of an arbitrary regime pursue an expansionist agenda that threatens liberty in the most comprehensive uh, way by circumventing the law. At the same time, however, a growing recognition of the totalitarian goals of the administrative state has fed what many have called a populist uprising here and in Europe. Populist is one word for this phenomenon an affirmation of sovereignty underwritten by a passion for freedom is another and possibly more accurate phrase. Thank you very much. So I'm delighted to uh, 
take questions, comments, and animadversions. Frank? Thank you so much for that talk, which I found wonderfully rabble-rousing. Uh, but I was curious about one thing. Amongst the words you mentioned, one word was conspicuously absent, and that was the word equality. Because I thought part of the reason for Trump's triumph last year was the recognition that we had been divided into different classes, and that indeed it was specifically liberalism which had abandoned the idea of equality in identity politics, uh, in the class politics implicit in John Rawls, and that in particular in the decline of religion, which after all is the only solid basis, I think, for any sense of solidarity or equality. Um, well, I think actually the word equality does appear in the, in the talk. Um, it, I didn't stress it because I'm not sure that uh, equality in the substantive sense, anyway, is uh, the proper goal of a liberal, that is to say, freedom-loving regime. Uh, equality before the law is one thing. Um, uh, equality of outcome, as they say, I think is something quite other. Um, I guess what I was mostly interested in thinking about, you know, I, I should just say, back up, and David mentioned that we published a series on populism uh, in the New Criterion. And when I first thought about this series, I thought, well, I was hostile to populism, uh, for, partly for aesthetic reasons, um, but partly for, I guess, substantive ones. But as time went on, so we, I think we called the series The Perils and Promises of Populism or something. I think I would now, uh, there are certainly perils, but I would now stress the promises of it. I think that um, uh, I become increasingly convinced that what stands behind it principally is a desire to reclaim uh, freedom. And freedom, I think, tends to be, I think Co Tocqueville was right, it tends to be in, in tension with equality. You, you need, to have, your regime needs to have both uh, in some kind of uh, harmony. But I think we have gone far down the road of uh, giving an, the advantage to equality over freedom. So that's what I'd say about that. I just wonder whether populism is founded more on uh, a desire to reclaim sovereignty or some other philosophical notion, whether there's really much ideology behind it at all, given that Bernie, both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump could its mantle, and whether it's founded more on, or at least to a, a, a disturbing degree, on jealousy, um, the desire to blame other people uh, for failure to equip oneself to function in an extraordinarily complex mm. modern economy. Well, uh, when you speak about um, people who are bitter about their fate and who blame others for their failure. Are you, are you talking about Hillary Clinton or do you have somebody else in mind? About uh, any Bernie Sanders, I, 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 uh, I, I, Bernie Sanders. Partly, Sanders, partly, in, partly in jest. I'm not sure that, as I say, I don't think that Bernie Sanders particularly um, claimed the mantle of populism. I think it was foisted upon him. Populism was, I think, it was a term of, of abuse. It was, you know, uh, but it had, it was a little bit like the Br'er Rabbit, you know, that he, Donald Trump, anyway, didn't mind being called populist. Um, you know, like any large human phenomenon, there are many aspects to it. And uh, I'm sure that there, you know, there people were unhappy and legitimately unhappy that, you know, they found that their wages hadn't ri risen in 15 years and so on. There are a lot to be unhappy about. Uh, and sure, they, there was a, a large cohort of Trump supporters um, uh, felt that they had been left behind. There's no question about that. But it, it's curious. I find when you when I would read something in say the New York Times about this, they would announce this, and that would be trotted out as somehow a reason not to trust uh, Donald Trump. Why? You know, sure they felt left behind because they were left behind. That was a reality. And um, so then the question is, well, is it is it somehow uh, part of the arrangements of our society in a larger sense that's responsible for that, and what can we do about it? Um, 
I, I find, frankly, the, the, the uh, disparagement of um, uh, what I would regard as kind of a healthy patriotism, which I think is what do, part of what Donald Trump was, was speaking to, um, uh, one of the most troubling aspects of our current political dispensation. And I think that, that um, I'm not saying that it's an unalloyed phenomenon. There's plenty of sides of Donald Trump that you, we, one might find more palatable than, than other sides. But I think that he spoke to a, a, um, a, an important political reality. You know, Frank Buckley here, who asked the first question, uh, once wrote in a column that he always regarded Donald Trump as the perfect candidate, not because he was without flaws, but because he was the one candidate who could beat Hillary Clinton. And uh, in retrospect, I did not support Donald Trump during the primaries, but I uh, later came to uh, s see what I think of as his advantages. Um, I, I think that Frank was right about that. And I regarded uh, Donald Trump's presidency as an unmitigated success in the early morning hours of November 9th. Why? Because Hillary Clinton was not president. I, I think that she would have transformed this even more into a one-party state uh, than it already is. And uh, she, in my view, was the, the single most corrupt person ever to run, or ser you know, serious candidate to run for the presidency. She would have further weaponized uh, the IRS and the EPA and so on. Uh, she probably would have destroyed institutions like the Heritage Foundation. She certainly would have made an effort to do that. Um, so, uh, so it's all gravy from uh, November 9th, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> uh, <laughs> There are going to be there are going to be disappointments. Uh, you know, I, I don't doubt that. Yeah. I think somebody behind you there has. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, taking my question. Um, so, w I've been doing some research in regards to uh, federalism, as it used to be versus the way that it is now, and how it's related to culture and this idea that federalism was originally created in part because of a desire for decentralization, and in part because the states were not willing to cede their sovereignty to a single authority and give them force. You know, the, the, diff, the argument between the anti-federalists and the federalists wasn't over um, areas of authority, it was whether there should be an empowerment of force in the central government. Would you be able to comment on whether there are similarities between that and the debate between globalization and nationalization that you mentioned earlier? Are there similarities, and if so, to what extent? Well, do you mean uh, th that uh, the, the, the globalist impulse would be uh, uh, something that regarded individual nation states as the individual states of the United States were regarded by the Federalists, and the, uh, that nation states should thereby uh, should therefore cede some of their sovereignty to uh, uh, an international agency that will take care of us all. Is that is that I'm not sure if I is that am I? I think I that's 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 kind of j the gist of it. It's it's the idea that you have a so you have a sovereign government um, that s it, it seems to me that they're reluctant to cede sovereignty because of cultural differences and because there is an advantage to decentralization. And on the other side, there's a push that says we need to cooperate for the greater good. Well, I think that is um, uh, um, the advocates of, of what you outline would be followers of Immanuel Kant in that respect. A and I am not. I think that would be a disaster. I think that the nation state is the primary guarantor of uh, uh, liberty and prosperity, and that uh, the, the, what I would regard as the utopian effort to transcend nationality uh, for the sake of a, tr of a transnational progressive uh, dispensation would be uh, a disaster for, for freedom and a, a disaster for uh, uh, prosperity. So um, I don't like it. Thank you. Excellent talk. You describe the tyranny of the executive branch, in a sense. And the question arises, what would Madison do? If the solution is resurgence of congressional prerogative, 
we have a Congress that for many, many years doesn't pass budgets but only continuing resolutions, doesn't review new regulations before they take place, and even with control today, doesn't seem to be able to make any we, we have a very weak Congress, clearly, and that seems to be a big part of the solution. Yeah. Well, you know, as, as I said, sort of in passing, uh, I don't think this is a problem of, uh, that can be put uh, at, at the doorstep of one political party or the other. Um, I, I advocated some, uh, a couple of years ago, the creation of a new 501c3 organization that we might call throwthebumsout.org. Um, I, I, th I think that uh, our legislatures, legislators are um, derelict in, in performing their duty. And uh, the public should be more and more angry about that. Um, the problem is, of course, that you, know, you, you win elections and then what happens? If real power is not being wielded by your lawfully um, uh, elected officials, what, what do you do about that? Well, you know, you try to drain the swamp, but let's face it, um, in this sublunary, imperfect world, you're never going to get everything you want. So you, you, you get what you can, and um, uh, you keep sort of, you know, pushing a, a few steps here, a few steps there. But we should not be under any illusion about the, the, the sort of the, the, the texture or complexion of, of the, those uh, who rule over us. It's, it's, um, it's, it's not ideal, but then this is not an ideal world, as you may have noticed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask, in light of your uh, uh, narrative, uh, how it applies to President Trump in light of his so far excellent decisions regarding the Supreme Court and uh, the federal judges. As you may know, he now has uh, 21 uh, federal appellate or district uh, judicial nominees, uh, you know, a lot of um, openings there, over 120. And of course, the uh, nomination and confirmation of Neil Gorsuch, it seems to me that this could turn out to be his biggest, most important domestic legacy and directly relates to the a lot of the uh, the very fine points that you uh, made in your talk. Yes, I, um, I, I, I mentioned, as I mentioned, I was not an early Trump supporter, but um, since he was not Hillary, I was supporting him. And then I began listening to what he said. And uh, on the courts, you know, I think he's been very well served by the Federalist Society. His list of, of possible justices and judges is unexceptionable. If, you, if what you're interested in finding are, are um, uh, uh, judges and justices who uh, will uphold the law rather than attempt to um, create social pol further a certain social policy by making the law. Uh, so I think that is terrific, and I think you're right. It's going to be um, uh, a long and ben beneficial legacy that, that he has bequeathed us. So uh, it will doubtless be very, very important. Um, there are many other things. I mean, his at attack on the uh, on, on regulation on the not just over regulation but um, stupid politically inspired regulation uh, is very important how far he can go down that road I don't know there are a lot of vested interests uh, pushing back uh, it would be nice I think if the Secretary of Education would rescind all of those dear colleague letters that uh, that in, in, intrude illegitimately it seems to me on the uh, the, the purpose of a of colleges, which is to educate people. Uh, there, there are a lot, a lot of issues, but he's so far, I have to say, although his style is not something that I am used to necessarily from the President of the United States, in terms of substance, it's been pretty good. Somebody was yeah. Thanks for coming out. I had a question about um, kind of the nature of populism and the people, um, I, I guess the, the people within a nation, because the populism that you're discussing is this idea, idea of kind of a patriotic populism. Um, I, I think you even may have used that term. 
but populism certainly also has kind of an emotional element to it. And the emotion right now happens to be a patriotic emotion. But we can certainly see that emotion change into a different kind of emotion in the future. You know, you, you reference Tocqueville, and Tocqueville talks about the three things that really hold society together. You have family, religion, and the states in place of the aristocracy. But those are three areas where um, and hopefully that'll change over the next few years, but certainly we still are losing ground in those areas, which means that in the next election cycle, the emotion could be emotion that's not so much a patriotic emotion as uh, some other emotions, uh, identity politics, or w what have you. How should we anticipate that? Well, you know, Aristotle says that rhetoric is the art of persuasion, and rhetoric uh, operates chiefly by appeals to emotion. And who are the uh, predominant rhetoricians in a society? Well, they're, they're politicians, right? So um, you need to have politicians that appeal to emotions, the right emotions. And there certainly will be, uh, and there are right now. I mean, you, you, all you need to do is turn on the uh, television. You see people uh, appealing to um, very unpleasant emotions. Uh, you know, people uh, parading around with a, a you know, the a model of a severed head of Donald Trump and, and on and on. But, uh, you know, that's, unfortunately, politics is not <clears throat> a science. It's, it's, you know, it's a matter of experience and art and compromise and all of that nasty stuff where you don't get everything that you want, you get some things. I, you know, I, you know, I, I was wrong once many years ago, and I thought I was mistaken. But I think I will. Uh, I will predict that that the, the this upsurge of uh, anti-Trump animus will fade as his as he succeeds. I think he will succeed. If the the critical thing I think is is, is economic growth. If in a year you've got three percent growth and it, things are going well, then all of these people are they're just this, they're just going to you know be out there in outer darkness wailing and gnashing their teeth, and so, I think. But there's no, uh, there are no guarantees. You know, you need a lot of, a leader, an effective leader needs a lot of things, including luck. He needs luck, you know. If Kim Jong-un decides to do something bad, that would be bad, you know. But uh, I'm hoping the Chinese will take care of it, but they, they may not, you know. So there, there are, there's no, that's what makes life so interesting. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. And I'm sure you're happy to take a few more questions, but we'll adjourn.